Alliance challenges, Whitledge 2022. Focus on leading impactful research in facilitating dialogue on financial crime regulation in emerging economies. Dr. Azinge Ebiri founded the Global South Dialogue on Economic Crime, that's GSDEC. Recently, she was appointed by the United Nations as a member of its Knowledge Network for Africa and is a member of the Society for Legal Scholars. Dr. Azinge Ebiri's research has largely influenced her teaching. She has developed two courses focused on international finance financial services regulation, which examine the interplay between global frameworks and their adaptability across developed and developing countries. A core aspect focuses on financial crime regulation and the role of international financial institutions in mitigating this crime. Dr. Azinge Ebiri obtained her PhD in international financial crime regulation from the University of Warwick. United Kingdom. She also obtained her LLM in international economic law with a distinction from the same university. She holds an LLB degree from the University of Leicester and has been admitted as a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. Um, so I seize the opportunity to welcome Dr. Nkechi Azinge as she gives a presentation on counter-terrorist AML CTF financing compliance challenges in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail, and thank you. Um, hi, Wally, how are you doing? So good day, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all today, um, which coincidentally is a good Friday. And today I'll be talking about um, the global AML challenges for African countries. And in doing that, my core argument, do you want- Thank me you, Nkechi. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Do you want yeah. me to share my slides because I'm unable to move it when it's on yours? Okay, ma'am. You can call me in Kichi. Okay. Give me a second. Okay. So basically what I'm going to do is in discussing my main title, I'm going to connect the dots looking backwards. And that means going back to the time, the colonial era. And my in, in doing this, I would kind of highlight my core argument and underscore it. And my core argument is that there's a correlation between money laundering so when you look at African colonial history and money laundering in Africa, there's a correlation between them. And more than that, when you look at the global standards for regulating money laundering and terrorist financing, you would see that it does not necessarily recognize certain peculiarities and challenges within African countries. And that in itself has led to unintended consequences where African countries are not complying and do not necessarily have the structure to comply. And so there's a need for us to challenge the global standards in a way that would mandate the inculcation of expert perspectives from the African countries. So my discussion is going to be in three parts. First, I'm going to give a brief discussion on Africa's colonial history and its impact on money laundering on currencies. And then I'm going to then look at the compliance trajectory of African countries. And lastly, I'm going to then examine the compliance challenges of African countries. So practically asking why are African countries not complying as they ought to. 
Now, when we hear about colonization, instinctively we think of slave trade, but it goes beyond that. It was much deeper than that. It was economic deprivation in many ways. And when I say many ways, it cuts down to pathology, which for instance, focuses on the causes and effects of diseases. And when I say pathology, you'd realize that when we think about the diseases that are prioritized today, automatically we think of malaria and tuberculosis, right? And then the question then becomes, why are these diseases prioritized? And they are prioritized because the global framework, particularly the global North countries, so the developed countries decided that these are the diseases that we would prioritize simply because at the point of colonization, these were the diseases that, that primarily affected the colonial masters who came into the country. And when we talk about colonization in this, in this instance, it's not just about the prioritization, it's also the fact that these diseases have then been coined in a way and, and, and systemized in a way that they then benefit developing countries. So when you think about what do you use to treat malaria today, you po possibly use nets, you possibly use um, insecticides. Where are these, as, where are these uh, manufactured in developed countries, right? So when you look at pathology, when you look at agriculture, when you look at uh, um, even the oil industry, you will see that everything works in in a way that even till today benefits the colonial master. And this goes down to the point of slave, uh, the, the period of slave trade. Even after slave trade was abolished, what you noticed was that there was exorbitant taxation, there was illicit transfer of wealth from African countries. <clears throat> To the colonized and um, to the colonizers, again there was a lot of exclusive rights granted by British firms or granted to British firms over mineral and natural resources. Now, what does all of this have to do with money laundering? Now and its regulation. Now, the the what we would realize is that there was prevalent exploitation at the point of slave trade and colonization quite generally. And this in itself set the tone for the decolonization era. And there were a lot of kickbacks during the decolonization era, with the colonial masters practically making a key argument. And the key argument was that if we leave these countries to become independent, the reality is that they are then going to be, be they're going to engage in corruption, they're going to engage in bribery, they're going to be very uh, uh, corrupt in themselves, so we cannot leave them alone, we have to have our range over them. But the reality is that it was expected that African countries, especially Nigeria, would behave this way because the colonial masters have in, had instituted regimes that would enable us behave this way, they had behaved this way themselves. So it was kind of like a learning process. So what you then realize is that they instituted these frameworks for these, these ill activities to perpetuate. Now, the struggle for independence continued and a lot of African countries gained their independence or independence in quotes. But again, it was marred with corruption, bribery, and money laundering. But let's be clear that these terms, particularly money laundering, was not defined at that point. And then when it came to regulation during the military era in Nigeria, the focus then was on corruption and bribery. There was no recognition of money laundering at all, even though the activities in themselves perpetuated. And when we say money laundering, what do we mean? Money laundering is simply committing an illegal activity. When you commit the illegal activity, which might be corruption, you then give the proceeds of that crime legal appearance, right? So these activities were already taking place even during the colonization period. Now, because Nigeria, for instance, focused, not just Nigeria, other African countries, they focused on, on curbing corruption and bribery, but then they did not look at money laundering, right? So it created space for the global stage to take to, to, to then um, set in place policies for this. So first we had the Vienna Convention, which is a UN convention which came to curb money laundering. And this UN convention focused mainly on money laundering with regards to drug crimes, right? Mm -hmm. So, and for instance, you see the NDLEA of today in Nigeria, it was an offshoot of the Vienna Convention. 
But later and more prominently, we then saw policy bodies take center stage, and that policy body is known as the Financial Action Tax Force. And with the Financial Action Tax Force coming into being, it came to set standards that countries are encouraged, in quotes, but the reality is that countries are mandated to comply with these standards. And when you fail to comply, there are implications for that. Now, this in itself was a new colonial agenda. And I say that for various reasons. First reason is that the financial act on tax force in itself was established by the G7 and the standards which the FATF set or FATF or FATF um, set was derived mainly from the G7 countries, primarily from the US standards so the US, the UK, France, they already had banking standards in their countries that were set to govern money laundering and terrorist financing. So practically these standards were picked up and then countries were then, other countries were then made to apply it. So picked up, the FATF used them to set their own standards, 40 global standards, and every country is then mandated to apply it. Again, I say neo-colonial because when you look at the FATF, who are its members? Its members are primarily OECD member countries, right? And then the BRICS countries, so Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, right? And although South Africa's inclusion is sort of belated, but not just belated, it's been questioned why is South Africa part of this network and is largely because South Africa was needed to ensure that there's some form of inclusion or global spread, whereas in reality, South Africa has very limited say in, in the FATF. Now, again, neocolonial, because when you ask yourself, okay, these are the members, what advantage do they have as being members? They have advantage, the advantage of being able to have a voice in the FATF, being able to vote on issues, being able to deliberate on standards, being able to influence what becomes standards, right? So in the absence of an institutional voice, so who doesn't have an institutional voice? Non-members do not have an institutional voice. And if you see the way the FATF works, so practically, it has its core members, which are OECD members and the BRICS. It then has pockets of membership organizations where different countries can then come on there as a group, right? So for instance, in West Africa, we have Giaba, right? And Giaba practically groups all West African countries. And they are then members of Giaba, but not members of the FATF. Now, what then that means is that Giaba can then claim to be a member and have a voice, although its voice is limited, because I did talk to members of Giaba, and they tell you when we're deliberating on issues that concern African countries, it is difficult. We practically do not have a say on issues that concern us. Now, in the absence of an institutional voice, it's not uncommon or it's not unexpected that the eventual standards would actually, or the framework actually lacks the nuances that would facilitate Africa's robust compliance. And the reality or the implication of this is that there are unintended consequences of these standards. Now, when I say unintended consequences, what do I mean? So I'll talk a bit about the standards and some of the unintended consequences. One of the key standards of the FATF is that Every country should have in place customer due diligence. So your banks or financial institutions should have customer due diligence. What does this mean? It means at the point of opening an account, at the point of engaging certain key professionals, so for instance, like lawyers and accountants and all of that, they should carry out customer due diligence on their clients. So in Nigeria, what, what is customer due diligence? So for instance, if you want to open an account, you must have an address. Sometimes the bank officials would follow you physically to your address. You must have a national identity card. Um, you must have done your, um, BV, you must have your BVN number, things like that. Now, and this is the case across many jurisdictions, right? Now, a few years ago, I stayed in Abidjan for a few months and my mom had called me to say that she wanted to send some stuff over. And I told her, well, I don't have an address. And she was like, are you living in a bush? And I'm like, no, for real, I am not living in a bush, but I don't have an address. And it kind of shocked her. But then the reality then is, 
if the FATF is mandating that you check physical address, you check this, you check that to ensure that the person who, to practically rid yourself of the risk associated with opening an account for someone who might, might launder money or facilitate terrorist activities, you are then shutting people out of the banking system, right? So by trying to kill a bird, you're killing 10, right? Now, the reality then is that if people like me are unable to open an account in a city where I live, it then means that other people who would possibly have all it takes to open an account would possibly exploit the underground banking system, right? And that in itself is antithetical to the FATF's objectives. And why do I say it's antithetical? Because the FATF wants a lot of people in the banking system. Because if more people are in the banking system, it means there are less people in the underground banking. It means that it's able to create paper trail and effectively then, then effectively combat money laundering or terrorist financing. So it then shows that there are nuances that the FATF does not necessarily address. In addition to that, during the COVID period, the FATF came and said, okay, um, we want digital identity and we want that digital identity so that people can use um, bank accounts, their banks, bank accounts, even from their homes, from the comfort of their homes. And we wanted to include, um, to, to encompass the, a framework that would combat money laundering all well and good. Nigeria decided, okay, we would shut our banks. People can use their um, bank apps. People can use their digital identity. But the reality is at that point, we didn't have that much people who had their digital identity. I remember registering for my NIN many years ago, about eight years ago, and I only just got it about two years ago. So basically how ready were we and what we saw during the pandemic was that there was a run on the banks and when I say the run on the banks I don't mean that in literal banking sense but I mean that in the literal sense of people were practically queuing at banks and practically breaking things to get in right and that in itself is problematic again in Kenya what we saw is that there were nuances in the sense that yes there were better able to adopt digital identity, but then you raised issues of ethnic discrimination and also there were questions about privacy breach. Now, yes, I do agree that we should have a robust digital identity, but more importantly, I agree that it should be built in a way that can adequately combat money laundering and terrorist financing. So for now, we see that Nigeria is pushing for um, a, a stronger digital identity, but then the extent to which it's working is questionable. Like for instance, it's almost like you're doing A, but you're affecting B. I was in Nigeria a few months ago and th this was just in December, January when they started the cashless policy again. And some guy who runs the POS came to take money and practically he had reached the limit so he couldn't take out money. So his business was affected and then other businesses are then affected. And even till today, I hear people say, we can't even pay for hospital bills. We can't do A, we can't do B because we don't have access to cash. That in itself is problematic. So in trying to solve a problem, you're creating many others, which in itself, it's not great for combating issues such as even money laundering. Now, like I mentioned, another key uh, 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 recommendation of the FATF is that countries, also when you have lawyers, for instance, lawyers should be able to report their clients when they suspect that their clients are committing or going to commit money laundering and terrorist financing. As law students, you would know that there is the legal professional privilege, which basically says that you have to protect your clients confidentiality. So basically, you have to protect your client's um, information. So whatever information your client has given you, um, it has to be treated with, uh, it has to be confidential, right? And then clients can then trust you and bring issues to you. But the FATF says otherwise, you know, if your clients are going to commit a crime, you have to report them. Now in Nigeria, the law was, the law was instituted, but how was the law instituted? The law was instituted in a problematic way and it led to a lot of court cases. Practically, because when you look at the money laundering law, it said that when a client is engaging with a lawyer on a deal that is above a thousand pounds, a thousand dollars, automatically, 
you should report that client. That itself is not what the FATF says. But what is the unintended consequence of that? The unintended consequence of, in this case, the misapplication of the FATF standard is that clients would then not go to the lawyers. Because if you have to report me on every case, what about a thousand dollars, then why should I come to you, right? And why should I not find alternative ways to deal with my issue? But more importantly, it does also means that there's loss of business on the lawyer's end. And so lawyers rightly contested this and they contested this and they won. And the court practically said that the Money Laundering Act would not apply to Nigerian lawyers. Of recent, there's a new Money Laundering Act of 2022. And although it corrected a lot of mistakes of the former act, it still made the same, replicated the same error in saying when their payments over a thousand dollars, it should be reported. That in itself is problematic. Now, there's also the unintended consequence on CSOs, that's um, civil society organizations. So for instance, um, there's the concern that civil society organizations facilitate terrorist financing. And as a result of that, the FATF has said that they should be regulated for that purpose. Now, the implication is that there's over-regulation of CSOs, but more than that, there's reduced funding ability. Now, governments have also used the AML CFT regulations for human rights violations. So for instance, we saw that during human rights violations against CSOs and people who run CSOs. So for instance, we saw that during NSAS, there were a lot of people who were raising money online um, through various methods to practically augment the work uh, uh, of the protest. But what did we see? We saw that the government said clamping down on their on their accounts. And in doing that, the CBN governor and, and other members of the government who fought them were practically saying, oh, they're funding terrorism. But that in itself was not true. Now, what's the implication of, 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 the, of, of, of strictly applying the FATF recommendation on CSO? The implication is that there's going to be loss of funding. There's also going to be non-execution of projects. There's going to be delay of projects as well. And it also shows that the FATF is unable to draw the line between the potential risk an organization or a CSO organization poses as opposed to the actual abuse of a CSO. So that in itself is problematic. Now we see that these are some unintended consequences that are worth examining. But more than that, the unintended consequence goes beyond standards to methodology for assessment or even who is assessing. So when we say countries have to be assessed on those standards, what we mean is that human beings like you and I are trained to go into countries and then they then have a checkbox where they determine how countries, but more than a checkbox, they're not doing it in a way that is more um, nuanced. But basically, they go into discussions with different countries to determine how well countries are complying with standards. Again, as human beings, they are biases. And these biases mean that there are challenges in the way that Sorry, there are challenges in the way they assess and there are challenges in the outcome of the assessment. So for instance, in South Africa, the assessors went in and said, oh, the terrorist financing sanction is so low. It has to be improved. But then when benchmarked against about 50 countries, he saw that it was actually just within range. So we then see that there are challenges with there are human challenges that can lead to unintended consequences because when that penalty is then increased, it then becomes too high that in itself is problematic and it then infringes on certain rights of people. Now, when, so practically to determine how well African countries are complying, even with the unintended consequences that they face. What I did was to look at the mutual evaluation report of 30 African countries and recorded these in numbers. And I looked at the mutual evaluation report and benchmarked them against the 40 recommendations from the period of 2007 to 2015. And from the period, for that period, 
about 30 countries were less than 50% compliant, and only seven of those countries were at least 50% compliant, with Egypt, Tunisia, and Mauritius practically ranking ahead. And on the other hand, they were the weakest regions, and these included Burkina Faso, Liberia, and Tanzania. Interestingly, two of the weakest regions are still blacklist or listed by the FATF today. Now, why do we lack the, why are African countries not complying? Yes, there, there's one end of the story, which is my core argument, which is that they have peculiarities that have not been taken into consideration. And then there's the other side of the story, which is indeed tied to the first part of the story. The African countries lack the preconditions for effective anti-money laundering um, regulation. And when I say it's tied, it's because the framework for regulating money laundering and terrorist financing was were built to be inadequate during the colonial era. And that in itself has perpetuated till today. So for instance, for a country to be able to adequately combat money laundering and terrorist financing, it not just needs financial stability, strong governments, strong institutions, strong regulation and enforcement systems, but it also needs to ensure that its people have confidence in these systems. In the absence of this, that in itself would mean that the country would struggle to comply. And this is the situation in most African countries. Now, countries are assessed every four to five years to determine how well they're doing. But in between the period of assessment, there's a follow-up assessment. And that follow-up assessment practically trails the areas that the countries have struggled to comply with. Now, when I say you have four to five years, it also means that you have four to five years to prepare, right? The reality is that countries wait up until one year before the assessment or a few months before the assessments to start to comply. And the reality is that these African countries are shooting themselves in their foot. Now, when I say they are waiting, it then means that there's no this institutional system is weak, and then there's no confidence in the institutional system, the political system, and the governance system, government system. And also the regulatory system is also weak because it's the regulators who would usually um, uh, 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 push for other institutions to carry out, other uh, financial institutions to participate in the process. Now, when assessors come into the country, they are not just going for EFCC, ICPC, um, SCOMO, for instance, um, customs. They're not just going to these institutions. They're also going to banking institutions to see how they are complying. They're also going to investment institutions to see how they are complying, organizations as the case may be. So practically, you would need to ensure that these institutions are working together for four or five years, right? So when you look at the countries that have complied the most, for instance, Spain, the United Kingdom, what you notice is that the story is that they start to plan way ahead of time. They don't wait. And why do they plan? They plan because a lot of the review is purely document review, right? Now, Practically, they're asking how many cases have been, how many, how many people have been convicted, how many cases have you have been instituted, what were the outcomes of the cases and things like that. Okay, so they go to the judiciary, they go to the banks. How have you been able to uh, uh, find out which which a flag of money, suspicious transactions, right? So how have you been able to ensure that there's follow up on these cases? What's your interaction with EFCC like and or, or NFIU rather? Now, this information gets lost in translation because we do not have strong institutions and also there's lack of political will and we do not have a data system in place. So that in itself is problematic. And as a result of that, countries are gray listed or blacklisted. Now, when I say blacklisted or relisted, what do I mean? It's the FATF's way of pushing countries to comply, right? And they do it by naming and shaming countries that have fallen back on compliance. Now, by naming and shaming, there are implications for this. So it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, I've been named, so what? 
But yeah, it's not so what, especially if you're a developing country. The implication is that developmental develop, development lenders become very wary. So people who would usually give uh, uh, aid or lend money to the country, like for instance, the IMF would be very wary of giving money to the country. So for instance, a certain country was listed by the FATF. Now, not an African country was listed by the FATF last year. And in being listed, there were arguments as to whether this country would get money. Now, this is this is a, a, a loan from the IMF. And the agreement was no. The country had checked all the box on literally all areas. But with regards money laundering and tariff financing, for the fact that it was listed by the FATF, the IMF declined to give the loan. Now, foreign investment becomes limited. Correspondent banking relationships are also strained. Now, when I say correspondent banking relationship, what I mean is, let's say I want to send money to Taiwan today and we do not have Echo Bank or let's say First Bank in Taiwan, I'll usually want to route it through another bank, right, um, in Taiwan. So let's say they have Taiwanese government bank, fictional name. I'd want to route it through that bank, right, or route it through... Uh, another bank in England that would then help to pay. Now that bank, that correspondent bank has the duty to ensure that I am complying with the FATF standards because if I am not complying, I'm exposing that correspondent bank to risk, right? Now, if my country is listed, that correspondent bank would be very wary of engaging in financial relationships with me, right? And it then means that my financial business is strained, right? And also the cost of remittance of sending money back home becomes higher. Now, Nigeria, sadly, recorded history as the first West African country to be listed. And sadly, again, this year, Nigeria fought to get off the list. It did get off the list. But sadly, again, this January, Nigeria was listed again. And Nigeria was listed alongside other jurisdictions. Remember I mentioned that Burkina Faso and Tanzania are two of the institutions that, um, two of the countries, sorry, that were, um, that were, that were the lowest compliance countries between 2007 to 2015, they are still on the list. Um, so it then shows that there are problems and these African countries need to work to ensuring that they not just build the institutions, but then they bring to the fore the unintended consequences and how these can be affected and how these can affect their compliance. And the FATF recognizes this because last year the FATF started on unintended consequences um, and unintended consequences uh, a project that seeks to understand how the application or misapplication of its standards can lead to unintended consequences for African countries. So what is the way forward? Now, there are two ways forward, which there are two ways forward. So the first way is to be an insider and the second is to influence as an outsider. Now, as an insider, the usual argument is that if you're not on the table, you are on the menu. Now, what this means is that if you need to influence a decision, or if you want to influence a decision, you must be at the negotiation table. And if you're not at the negotiation table, if you're absent, the likely outcome is not going to take you into consideration that much, but more than that, it's going to be likely unfavorable towards you. So you want to be at the table. So practically, it's fighting for inclusion at the FATF by arguing that the FATF in itself is undemocratic. And because it's undemocratic, it lacks legitimacy. And so African countries should be included. That way they have a say, they have a voice. And more importantly, they have a vote. And by that, they can influence policies in their decisions or influence FATF standards um, to, their, to, to, to their favor. But on the other hand, there are arguments that, okay, Yes, it's great to be an insider, but South Africa is an insider. So what difference has it made? Even South Africa suffers the brunt of unintended consequences. So the alternative is to be an insider, be an outsider, but bring evidence that would push for policy change. So gather enough evidence for the FATF's unintended consequences project to show that they are actually unintended consequences. And with that evidence, the FATF would no doubt have to stop and pause, 
right? And then consider those evidences. And chances are that change may come from there. So my conclusion is that, yes, the current situation of African countries cannot be divorced from the colonial period and also the post-colonial period. But then again, African countries need to build strong institutions and need to have the political will to actually combat money laundering and terrorist financing, both as an insider and as an outsider. So thank you for inviting me and I'm now open to questions. Abigail? Hello. Yeah, can you coordinate? Uh, we are expecting to see you. Okay, can you coordinate the question and answer sessions, please? Okay, fair. Um, so, first, we have a question from our executive director, Mr. Wole Kunaji, um, and it says that how can the tension between the FATF requirement of the disclosure and the traditional banking principle of client confidentiality be resolved without unduly abridging people's right to privacy? That's our first question, please. Oh, well, thank you. I kind of knew the hardest question would come from Wooly. <laughs> So it's, it's a difficult one, to be honest. So on one hand, clients have that right to privacy, which, for instance, in Nigeria, is already enshrined in the Evidence Act that practically says, um, except when a client is going to commit crime, you should not disclose, right? And that's, but that in itself is restricted to litigation. But the reality is that the FATF is saying that lawyers, you have to be gatekeepers or lawyers or accountants, the list of professionals it mentions, you have to be gatekeepers. And your gatekeeping role would ensure, would, would practically mean that you take a, a step back and you then determine, first you come conduct your CDD, customer due diligence, and then you then determine whether this case and, or this client is what taken on board. And what this means is that, so for instance, in the UK, the law here says that you're supposed to examine the transaction, examine your client, and then determine also, you're supposed to do this in a risk-based way. So practically determine the likelihood that your clients will be involved in money laundering or terrorist activities as a result of the client's antecedents and the history that you have access to. So for instance, the law in the UK says, if you ought to know that your client's activities are more like, are likely to lead to money laundering and terrorist financing, then chances are that you should report that. So practically in doing that is basically saying, I want to breach so it's basically saying we recognize that there's client confidentiality on one hand, but when it comes to crime and if you ought to know, and when we say ought to know, it then means that if a lawyer does not necessarily know, but looking at the transaction, you should have an idea. It then means that you can be caught by the law. Right. And there are cases in the UK when where you look at it, you're like, oh my God, like this is this is quite tight, like maybe the lawyer should have been let go of. But when you compare that to the situation in Nigeria, you then understand why the FATF takes its stance. Like for instance, in Nigeria, there was a case by on, I think, Olisa Abakoba, where the client had paid money to the lawyer and the lawyer did not 
investigate the source of the wealth. And the court basically said, yeah, it's fine. You don't have to investigate the source of your client's wealth. I think that's problematic because what we see in Nigeria is that churches get money and um, money is given to churches as charities. No one investigates it. Money is paid to lawyers. No one investigates the source. A lot of politicians use lawyers to loan their money. That in itself is problematic. Um, Ibori did that. All the lawyers that were involved in Ibori's case in Nigeria went scot-free. The lawyer involved in the UK did not go scot-free. So while we try to ensure client confidentiality on one hand, we have to also ensure that that confidentiality does not lead us to a point where we encourage and even participate in crime. So I think that's where the FATF tries to strike its balance. Okay, so I can see other questions. And so at some point the FATF faced just following on that question on, on the answer, the FATF faced kickbacks from a lot of countries, including the US. And the FATF has told countries how you the approach you take on ensuring that lawyers are gatekeepers is up to you. And so the US, for instance, has set it's, it's bar association is practically responsible for um, ensuring that lawyers play their part. And what it just sets is policy guidelines for lawyers as opposed to laws. So different countries have taken different approaches. And in doing that, the, con the FATF is practically saying, we recognize that countries have the peculiarities, bar associations have their peculiarities, and people want to do things differently. And so for that reason, we would encourage that you do, I wouldn't use the word encourage, we would mandate that you do ABC, right? But in doing that, do not facilitate crime. Um, Abigail, I, so your question is, <coughs> is it possible that some of the countries with high compliance rates can actually facilitate terrorist activities in other countries through financing? ETC and still hide behind the cover of being highly compliant. Yes, it is possible. Now, the fact that countries are highly compliant do not ne does not necessarily mean that they are rid of money laundering and terrorist financing. Now, it's one thing to be highly compliant on the FATF 40 recommendations. It's another thing to be effective, right? Now, when I say highly compliant, it means that you're compliant on paper, right? So you have the institutions in place, and all of that. So basically you're ranked as highly compliant. So for instance, the UK is ranked as highly compliant. But guess what? When we talk about fraud, the UK has not covered its loopholes on fraud. When we talk about even terrorist financing, the UK has challenges with terrorist financing. And more importantly, when we talk about money laundering, particularly in the real estate, the UK has yet to cover its back. Right. So you can be highly compliant, but still facilitate money laundering and terrorist financing. So, for instance, when we talk about Egypt, for instance, Egypt is the most compliant country in Africa, but then they still have issues with terrorism and terrorist financing. And the fact that you're highly compliant, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can hide. So let's take, for instance. Um, Egypt being highly compliant in Nigeria, if for any reason um, there is an issue on money laundering or terrorist financing in Egypt, it would still be highlighted. It would still be dealt with. Banks, correspondent banks would still disappear. Lenders would still be wary, irrespective of the fact that Egypt is classed as highly compliant by the FATF. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our next question is from Stella. Mm -hmm. she, sa she says that if, if there's a mechanism such as blacklisting in AML CFT, why are tax havens in other countries where dirty money is known to be stored so developed since the consequence is the withdrawal of development lenders? Are they not blacklisted and if not, why? 
is it only countries that try to join the FATF that can be blacklisted or there are some jurisdictions where they have little to no effect? So the FATF's blacklisting, um, blacklisting mechanism in itself is, has been highly debated on, right? Now the question is, which con- so basically, right, we have the global north and we have the global south. So the global south is developing countries. The global north is developed countries. Now, there's the global financial um, uh, 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 framework or the global financial system. And the question is, which countries are more in- which countries are more ingrained into the global financial system is usually the global north countries, right? Now, what's the implication of that? The implication is that if England should sneeze, for instance, as one of the developed countries, chances are that France would catch a cold and chances are that Nigeria may catch a cold, right? So what that means is that even when England or the United Kingdom is somewhat compliant or is highly compliant on paper, a small fault in England right, right. let's say England is defaulting on one recommendation, that in itself can have catastrophic implications. Now let's take Ghana that is far removed from the global financial center. Now with Ghana being far removed, if Ghana is not compliant on 10 recommendations, chances are that it's not really going to affect the global financial center that much, right? Now applying this to the, how blacklisting works, when countries are blacklisted, usually you would see that the first list would come out and that first list would usually have developed and developing countries alike. But at the point when the list comes out, the developing countries who are members of the FATF sort of disappear. And that's how it works. So people have actually campaigned against this. People have written about this to say, what is the politics of blacklisting? Because surely there's a problem with the way countries are blacklisted. And what you then see is that they are tax heavens and tax heavens are actually built to, or not, so basically, so there was a tax heaven that emerged because it was a small country and it decided it wanted to grow. And so it made itself a tax haven. And the idea was that, a lot of money came in that wasn't checked. So it was actually laundering money, right? Now, and in laundering money, there has been new eyes on these countries and regulations have come in place in these countries to ensure that, yes, you're a tax haven, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're aiding crime. But that's not the reality, as um, you would know, Stella. So what it then means is that the question then is, Are developmental lenders going into these jurisdictions? Developmental lenders would usually go into countries except there's key reasons not to. But the reality is because these countries are not listed, chances are that they still get aid. So that's the politics of blacklisting. It's not as straightforward as it ought to be. All right, thank you very much. And And also, sorry, on the effect of blacklisting, Okay. Some countries are blacklisted, but does it have an effect? So practically, there's this lady, Julia Black, who has written on blacklisting. And she says that, yes, where where countries are blacklisted, they up their game and they, they practically ensure that they get off the list, right? So for instance, Nigeria being blacklisted in January, I saw... Um, that the NFIU, that's the Financial Intelligence Unit, recently said that um, governors can no longer take um, uh, 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 um, money in cash, like from the government's pocket. They can no longer, I think allocation allowance or something, they can no longer take it in cash. It had to be through the bank so that they can monitor. So what that tells me is that Nigeria is actually acting on, and I spoke to someone recently who, who works in NFIU, and he's like, we're embarrassed by this, we want to get off the list. So it then means that blacklisting has its effect. But then there are recent studies that have said that, okay, blacklisting does not necessarily have much of an effect. A lot of countries just think it's business as usual because 
they still have ways to get funding irrespective of the fact that they are on the blacklist. It's really business as usual for them. So it depends on the country and it depends on the, again, different countries have different reputations, right? So for instance, as a human being, you might have five reputations, reputation. So different people might see you differently. So for instance, Nigeria might have reputation, strong reputation on its export imports, strong um, reputation on maternal right, rights and all of that, but then weak rep reputation on money laundering. So for some countries that have strong reputations on many areas, they see it as just a glitch that would not affect them much or strong regulations on banking, strong reputation on securities law and stuff like that. So they might think, oh, it's a glitch. It won't affect us much because we're strong in other areas. But the reality, is that it can have its effect, but then the extent to which it has its effect is questionable and is largely dependent on the country as well. All right, um, thank you very much. Um, our next question is also from Stella and she's asking, also, would you say the cashless policy pursued by the CBN earlier this year was the best manner to implement the digital identity requirement, and the cash crunch was merely the unintended consequence, or the consequences were foreseeable and should have been managed better, or a better policy should have been put in place? Um, I'll start by saying I don't think it was done in the best manner. It should have been done in a manner that was phased. <laughs> Again, people have said that after all, other countries have done it in one day and it worked, but other countries are not Nigeria. So I feel like it should have been phased and that way people would be better prepared for it. Um, again, I, I, again, I feel like, again, it was colored with politics, right? So it wasn't a straightforward policy with an intended aim. It was a policy that was colored with politics. So that in itself made it even more difficult. And the credit crunch is, I would not say merely, is an unintended consequence that was a foreseen unintended consequence. The policymakers knew that that would happen. So it was a foreseen unintended consequence and should have been better managed and still should be better managed. Um, it, I know things have lightened up post the elections, but then from people I speak with, again, you guys might have a different perspective. It does seem like things are still a bit tight, but then it will be great to hear um, what Stella has to say as to whether things have gotten better now. Okay, thank you very much. And to our last question. Oh, I think Stella wants to say something. Yes, yes. Okay. About last week, it got a bit better, but the major problem was once people got cash, they didn't want to return it into the banking system because they were scared of another cash crunch. Yeah. So that was again. Oh, dear. <laughs> so it's basically a circle. Yes, yes, that's how it is now. So yeah. people that have cash have kept it. They don't want to spend it, oh, dear. but they don't want to return it to the bank. So a lot of people still don't have cash. Oh dear, that's not good. That's all. Thank you okay. for your answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so our next question, um, Ronke wants to know that in light of Nigeria being blacklisted, what then is the way out for Nigeria, especially in being compliant and effective with FATF guidelines? Um, <clears throat> so I'll say that the current the current people in Nigeria are dedicated. So when I say the current people, so basically there's um an interagency um there's an interagency forum that is dedicated to ensuring that Nigeria gets off the blacklist. So it was predicted that Nigeria would get on the blacklist. Well, I'll call it gray list because it's now jurisdictions under continuous money laundering. So there were predictions that Nigeria would get on the list because Nigeria did not necessarily have the right paperwork in place. So Nigeria can say, when, when, the, when assessments are going on, Nigeria would say, oh, we're compliant with this, we're compliant with that and that and that. Okay, show us evidence, there's nothing, right? So if there's no evidence, there's a problem. So basically, 
the way out is for Nigeria to start planning now. And that those plans are already in place, right? Start having the right policies in place. Start having the right experts that have key, like real data experts, right? And real tech experts that know how to put the paperwork together. <laughs> And also ensure that once they have these policies and documents and data, they practically marry them together in time for the FATF, um, uh, uh, in time for the FATF uh, review. Nigeria has the laws, right? Some laws might need tweaking here and there, but then in terms of the legal framework, we're strong on the legal framework, right? And you can see that in 2022, Nigeria passed about three laws already, one on terrorist financing, one on money laundering, and the last was on, lost it off the top of my head now, but it was all dedicated to, so asset recovery, but it was all dedicated to combating money laundering, terrorist financing, and all of that. So these laws were rushed, right? And they were rushed with the aim of ensuring that we evade the blacklist. Sadly, that didn't happen because it's more than, it takes more than laws to evade the blacklist. So, but now at least we have the laws, right? 90%. So what we then have to do is to ensure we have these people with political will do their job as part of the interagency network. And more than that, they have to work effectively with the private sector because the public sector cannot do it on its own. Now, my only concern is that post May 29th, there are going to be changes. A lot of people who are currently heads of these agencies will change and a lot of key positions in these agencies will change. So it's almost like a wait and see as to wait and see game to know whether the political will will, pe will persist post the new government. Um, and the next question is, is it pessimistic to conclude that there are chances that Nigeria will continue to be under the FATF blacklist given the deficiencies in country money laundering and are deported? And I would say yes, yes, yes and no. So we can be optimistic that the current guys who brought us here, sadly, <laughs> have now kind of woken up to see where we are. And it's not where, where they expected us to be or where they ever envisioned we would be because Nigeria always feels like, oh, it would not happen to us. After all, Ghana was on the blacklist and they're like, oh, that's Ghana, it's our small brother. We're bigger, we're better. But then the reality is that our institutions are weak. Our institutions can be stronger. So recently, a, a colleague was conducting interviews um, on with, with some of these institutions. And practically, my colleague was asked to give bribe to ensure that the interviews can be done, right? And so the problem is, if these institutions are doing that, or people who work within these institutions are doing that, how then could, can we see the silver lining, right? So at that end, you can be pessimistic that, okay, or, or someone mentioned to me that she wanted to register for SCOMO, she's with an NGO, she wanted to register and get the SCOMO certificate. And practically they told her that she had to pay for it, right? So she had to give side money as opposed to just the regular registration process. She had to give side money. And she said she hadn't gotten her registration for two years and it was affecting her NGO. And I was like, wow. She's like, yeah. She's like, so any NGO you see that is registered, they possibly gave side money. And I was like, wow. Now that shouldn't be the case. If you're an organization that is there to register and authenticate or verify CSOs, then why, why are you taking side money, right? So on that end, you can say, okay, there's pessimism there, but then there's still strength. There are some good people working, because at the end of the day, the organization is all about the people, right? There are good people working there, who working in these organizations who are dedicated to seeing change. And our hope is that their strength triumphs over the weaknesses of the organizations. <laughs> Okay, right. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Ma. I also have a personal question ma. concerning the money laundering um, issues in Nigeria. 
Um, what are the suggestions you can also make for bodies like EFCC and ISPC that can so they can effectively deal with the issues on money laundering in Nigeria? That's a difficult one. So for me to do to give recommendations, like particular recommendations, I would have to do my my assessment first to see what their weaknesses are, their particular weakness weaknesses are. But then I would say that some things I would say would have to change would be one, ensuring that the institution in itself is not corrupt, right? So you cannot fight what you are, right? So except you're willing to like you must be actively ready and willing to fight corruption. So there has to be integrity in the institutions. It's only when there's integrity in the institutions that people will trust that that institution has the legitimacy to fight the fight it's fighting, right? And right now I struggle to see the legitimacy in a lot of these institutions, particularly with the current political figures we have at the helm of affairs. I think I would leave it there. With I will not go further as to the because everyone has their political differences. Now, um, again, I would say training. A lot of these people, a lot of people that work in these institutions do not have the requisite training that they need. And I would say that I myself have been, I've been able to conduct some interviews on a particular research area, but not on this. And in conducting that research, I was given answers that were wrong by some key staff. And I was wondering, okay, if you're telling me that, then how are you effectively doing your work, right? And that in itself was problematic for me. I had to meet, to an extent, it was practically the heads of, inst heads of departments that were giving you the accurate answers. But people who were actually doing the work on ground were, were giving you answers that were wrong right and that in itself is problematic so it means that they need training right and i would say the training has to be done in such a way where there's cross border training and when i say cross border training it's all good and fine to sit in a room and have someone come and talk to you and possibly run an assessment on like let's say a test or something to see whether you've gotten things right but it's another thing for you to watch from another jurisdiction's perspective, see how that jurisdiction is doing what you do and possibly doing it better and then learning practically from those institutions, from, from that uh, uh, jurisdiction. Yes, this would involve money, it will involve time, but then it's worth it. And lastly, I would say that there has to be a move towards adopting AI into the way these systems are built and how the systems work. Right, NIDA is currently pushing strongly towards the adaptation of AI across government parastatals, across institutions as well. So when we say, oh, um, financial institutions are reporting to the EFCC, the or the NFIU, sorry, the NFIU, it has to process all this information, right? And it's only able to process it when it has the instruments in place to process it, right? So working closely with NITDA, working closely with private organizations that work closely with NITDA would actually amplify the way these institutions are able to deliver on their task or their, or their key objectives rather. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, thank you okay. so much. Presentation. Um, I would like to um, invite Dr. Kuniju, the Executive Director of the Lex Lata Center for International and Comparative Constitutionalism, to please give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Hinkechi. Uh, that was a very brilliant presentation. Thank and you. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, but I think I might just do a paper or two, you know, um, in the coming <laughs> weeks on this particular topic. It's a very interesting topic. Thank, Thank you, you so much for honoring our invitation. And I believe that when we invite, when we invite you again, I'm sure you will um, respond. Yeah, most definitely. Thank you. I had a good time uh, and thank you for all the questions. They were actually interesting. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank, you. thank you so much, our distinguished audience. Um, 
this uh, event is being streamed live on YouTube. Uh, so after this particular event, uh, the presentation will still be available on YouTube for people who would like to, um, you know, have another look at the presentation later. Uh, many people visit my YouTube page, you know, um, from time to time. So I'm sure that uh, this will be very useful uh, for so many people in the coming weeks. Uh, thank you once again. Um, and thank you, everybody. We wish you all um, a happy Easter in advance. Um, enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Easter. All right. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, mom. You're welcome. Thank you, my best sister. Mm -hmm. Thank you to everyone yeah. who attended too. Mm. So we'll be ending the meeting now. Thank you.